So welcome to this episode of Circuit Bread. We are going to be talking about signal flow graphs. So in our previous tutorial, 1.4, we learned about block diagrams and how to represent transfer functions with block diagrams. And block diagrams are great because they make things very intuitive and you can move things around and all of that sort of stuff. And in that way, they are fantastic. However, there are some drawbacks. They get cluttered as the transfer function, as the system gets more complicated and it's very, it's a very manual process to simplify the block diagram. As we did in the last tutorial, you have to move things around and do this and that. Whereas with signal flow diagrams or signal flow graphs, it is a much simpler process to get exactly the most reduced form as you need. It's not actually a simple process, but you are guaranteed to get the simplest form. And it also uh, scales better. It's not as complicated as it gets bigger and bigger. So the transition to take a block diagram and move it into a signal flow graph is pretty straightforward. And let me draw those out right now, and then we will show how you go from one to the other. And some of the key things to look out for here is we are going to be looking at nodes, branches, and gains. So let me draw that really quick. All right, so now I have this written down and I'm referencing this, and I'm not sure if this is gonna to be too ugly and we'll just end up just showing a nice pretty picture on the screen instead of this, so we'll, we'll figure it out. But this is a block diagram and that is now being represented by a signal flow graph. And you can see a lot of the similarities here. You have your input R and then you have your output C, you have your feedback loop here with the H and then you have your G here. Now the replacements are, instead of having these arrows pointing to the summing and the subtracting nodes, you have just arrows going to different nodes. And then you have here, oh, we have a gain of one, we have a gain of G on this um, branch right here. And so this actually brings us to where those terms come in. As I mentioned, they are nodes, branches, and gains. So on here we have nodes, and that is every spot where something goes in and comes out. We have branches, which are a portion of the system. So I don't want to circle it and make this more horrible, but it's this portion right here, or this portion right here, or this portion right here. Those are branches. And then the gains, where we have the gains here of G and H, that's actually just written alongside the branch. And every branch should have a gain. So like right there, I should say that's a gain of one because that C that's going out just has a gain of one. Nothing is actually happening to it. Now, there's actually only three simple rules to follow when you're going from this to this. And the first one is that every summing point like this, takeoff point like this, and any variable are turned into a node like one of these. As you can see here, that summing point is turned into a node right here, and this takeoff point is turned into a node right here. So that is the first rule. And the, the rule is, the second rule is, this, if the summing point is before the takeoff point, they're represented by a single node. Now the third rule is that if a summing point is after the takeoff, then you get two nodes. And so this is best illustrated by the block diagram and signal flow graph that we're gonna be using quite a bit for the rest of this tutorial. So let's look at the block diagram and you can see on the left, there is a summing point uh, that R, the input goes into before it splits off into G4 and G1. And since the summing point is before the takeoff point, it is a single node when you're turning it into the signal flow graph. And then on the right, where you have the takeoff point going into G3 after G2, and then you have the summing point where G4 comes in, that's actually separated into two separate nodes. And that should make a lot of sense because as you're looking at it, you say, oh, okay, if that, uh, the point where G3 splits off is a different value than what the point where G4 will be. So if you wanna take a moment and think about that, maybe pause this and look at that image and say, wait, does this make sense? It should make sense to you that if you have the takeoff point before the summing node, it's going to need two nodes in the, sum, in the signal flow graph simply because they are going to be at different values. Whereas if the takeoff point is after the summing point, then those are at the same values because it's just the output from that summing point that goes and takes off. So that should be pretty straightforward. So some key terms that we're going to need to discuss is primarily the input node and the output node. And so the input node on one hand is pretty easy just to look and say, hey, this is the node that is going in. And then you could say, this is the output node because this is the node going out. However, the, the more programmatic way of thinking about it is the input node is the only node that will have, or a node that will have only outputs. 
And then the output node is the only node that has only inputs. And that's an interesting thing with this is I actually put this unity gain here at the end simply because otherwise this node right here is not technically an output node because it has an input and an output in this uh, feedback loop right here. So that's why I put a unity gain out to here. So then I could call this the output node, whereas this is the input node. And these are all going to be very important in Mason's rule. So input node and output node. Now the next is the path. And the path is basically the any way you follow these arrows. So you have all these arrows saying, OK, it's going this way, it's going this way. If I take this, I'm going this way. And that's basically just any movement through the system is a path. And that path can be in completely different depending on how it's set up. And again, we'll get into that more with the, um, with the example that we're going to be doing on Mason's law here pretty quick. Also, I feel like path is fairly intuitive as well. Now, a specific path is the forward path. So right now, if I were to look at this, I could go forward and then loop back, and that's no longer a forward path. It is a path, but it's not the forward path. So a forward path is anything, any path that connects the input node to the output node. And you can have multiple forward paths. It's actually very, very common and part of Mason's um, law that we identify all those forward paths. But a forward path is any path that just goes from input to output without looping back. Now, speaking of loops, a loop is any point where you start at one node and then finish in the same node. So in this case, it would be right around here. And that is the requirement for a loop is just, again, start and stop at the same node. And again, this is too simple to show it, but there's also, this is important, non-touching loops. And so that is when you have a loop where it starts and ends at one node, and it actually is completely different from another loop that starts and ends at the same node, and they don't touch any of the same nodes. And so again, that's, that's very important. And finally, the path gain, as we talked about earlier, is this G or H, or in this case, the unity of one. So those are the big things, the input node, the output node, the path, loops, non-touching loops, and gains. And I feel like we have now gotten to the point where we can start talking about Mason's law and figuring out what will be pretty dang complicated. All right, so I've been saying Mason's law, but we're actually going to get into what's called Mason's gain formula, which is a little bit ungainly. But Mason is actually the guy who developed this whole thing, and he just, again, created a way to take this and create a transfer function. And just really quick, I want to say I forgot to put an error right there, so that was technically incorrect. You want arrows on every part of your path, on every branch. So that's important. So let me get rid of this. I will draw up the, uh, the example graph that we've already talked about, the example signal flow graph, and we are going to talk about Mason's gain formula and figure out transfer functions. So let me do that. All right, I drew out our example signal flow graph, and I also drew out Mason's gain formula. And I think first we'll just review this signal flow graph really quick. So here on the left, we have our R, which is our input, and then our unity gain, and then this is just labeled node one. That's just for convenience of what we are referring to. And then we see G1 for gain on this branch right here, node two, then gain two to node three. And then we have a feedback loop of G3 connecting node three and two, and then unity gain from three to four. And then we have our feedback loop from four to one of negative G5. And now we also point out that there is a positive or a forward um, connection between one and four with G4. And then finally, a unity gain out to C, which is our output node. OK, so again, these are the nodes, 1, 2, 3, 4, R, and C. And then we have these different paths that can go through. You can go this way. You can go this way. You can go this way. You can go that way. Those are all different paths. And then finally, the different gains in this case are G1, G2, G3. There we go. G4 and negative G5. So this is the signal flow graph that we are going to use for our example, and we are going to figure out the ideal transfer function for it. And we are going to use what is called Mason's gain formula. Uh, 
So let's go over the formula in parts first, and that way later we can take all of these parts and put them together in a way that makes a lot more sense. So everything equals our transfer function, tf. That's something we learned about in uh, lesson 1.3, so you know all about transfer functions. Over here on the right, we have this sigma notation, and if you're unfamiliar with it, I highly recommend you go check it out. But as a quick summary, if, you've, if it's just been a while, this basically just says, hey, for k equals 1, take this and sum it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, whatever, up until you hit n. And then n is just dependent on the size of the transfer function. The bigger, more complicated the transfer function, the higher the number n will be. But you always start at 1, and you go 1, 2, 3, all the way up. So this delta down here on the bottom, that's a capital delta in the denominator, is the most complicated portion of this whole thing. And what you get up here will actually be slightly dependent on what you get down here, at least the delta k. So the delta, it won't change. That is going to be constant through the entire thing. That k equals 1, k equals 500, it doesn't matter. That delta is going to be calculated um, towards the beginning, and it will affect everything else. But it is actually 1 minus the sum of the individual loop gains plus the sum of the gain products of two non-touching loops minus the sum of the gain products of three non-touching loops plus until you run out with, you hit n and you're done. But I do want to point out that it, that was a minus plus minus plus, so the farther you go, it's changing every time. But the first one is the sum, and then the last, and then after that, it's the sum of the products. Again, this is going to be nice and confusing, and that is why we are going to do a beautiful example to show you exactly how this all works out. Now, going up to the numerator, we have our piece of k, and piece of k is the forward gain of that forward path that we are discussing at the moment. So as we look back on our example here, you can see that connecting our input and our output, we have this forward path, and we also have this forward path. And piece of k is simply the gain as we are going through that path. And that's a little bit more straightforward, but again, we'll do that in the example. And then delta k is dependent on delta, and it gets a little bit more complicated again, because delta k is the part of delta not touching the kth forward path. Fun, right? Again, I feel like all of this stuff is like a completely different language until you do an example, and then everything falls together. So let's get started on the example, and we will keep this as a reference because it's very easy since there's so many moving parts and so much stuff, it's very easy to get lost. I'm gonna try really hard to show exactly where we are in the process and what exactly we're figuring out. So let's, again, let's just jump into it. Okay, so the first step that we are going to do is we are gonna find these values of piece of k. And that is simply finding all the forward paths and then finding what the gain is for them. So as I mentioned earlier, you can see right here, input to output, that's one forward path and then you have a second forward path, and, and that's it. We don't have any more forward paths because we can't loop from three to two and then go forward. It's just all the way forward. So we have two forward paths. So it doesn't really matter which one you name, uh, the first or the second or the third or the fourth if you keep on going, but it does matter that you match those with your del delta k. So your piece of k has to match your delta k. So that's the most important thing. But here, we will just assume that going straight through the middle uh, from nodes R1, 2, 3, 4, and C, that's going to be our piece of 1, P1. And then we look at our gains there, and we have 1 times G1 times G2, and that's going to be going through everything, times 1 times 1 which obviously simplifies out to g1, g2. Now, p2 is just going to be from r to node 1 to node 4 to c. So that is simply going to be 1 times g4 times 1. So gain of 1, gain of, gain of g4, and then gain of 1, which then equals g4. All right, so now of the big, scary Mason's gain formula, we've already figured out that n is only going to be 2, and that piece of k is going to be p1 of g1, g2, and then p2, which is g4. So, already making good progress. 
So if you remember, delta was dependent on finding the loop gains, the individual loop gains, the non-touching loop gains, things like that. So our next step is actually going to be to identify all of the loops and figure out what their gains are. So as we go back and we look at this, we can see that there is a loop here from 2, 3, back to 2. There is a loop that goes from 1 to 4, back to 1. And then there's a loop that goes from 1, 2, 3, 4, back to 1. And those are our three loops. So let's write those down and their different gains. So, so let's say loop 1 is G2, G3. The one that we noticed started at node 2, just went to 3, and then went back. Loop 2 is going to be negative G1, G2, and G5. And of course, it's negative because G5 is negative right there. And then loop 3 will be negative G4, G5, because it is simply 1 to 4, then 4 back to 1. So those are the three loops that we have, L1, L2, L3. And the L1, L2, L3, that doesn't really mean too much. It's just a way to make it so things don't get too complicated in the interim, but it's going to get kind of bigger and uglier as we go out. Okay, so our next step is to figure out which of these um, loops aren't touching. And again, that's making sure that they don't have any of their nodes in common. So as we're looking at this, we have our L1 that goes like this, our L2 that goes all the way through and then back around, and then L3 that goes up through G4 and back through G5. At loop 1, with that 2 and 3, it actually um, it overlaps with L2 because L2 goes all the way through and back in G5, but it does not touch loop 3, which is all the way over, uh, which is just this big loop around. So the only two loops that don't touch are L1, the small loop in the middle, and L3, the big loop on the outside. Okay, does that make sense? We've identified forward paths. We've identified loops, all three of them. This one in the middle, this one that goes from one to four, back to one, this one that goes one to four, not skipping two and three, back through G5. And now we have established that what we have arbitrarily named loop one and loop three do not touch. Okay. We are putting together the pieces of the puzzle to make this Mason's gain formula work. And now that we have the pieces, we can actually go back and start plugging things in. So now that we know that n is 2, we can actually rewrite this Mason's gain formula if the summation sigma scares you and just write it out as piece of 1 delta 1 plus piece of 2 delta 2 all over delta equals the transfer function. So this is what we're working with now. So let's go back and review what delta is. Delta is 1 minus the sum of individual loop gains plus the sum of gain products of two non-touching loops minus the same sum of gain products of three non-touching loops. Now, looking at this, we don't have three non-touching loops. We only have the two. We only have loop 1 and loop 3. So all we need to do is 1 minus the sum of the gain products and then the the second part. All we have is 1 minus the sum of individual loop gains, loop gains plus the sum of gain products of two non-touching loops. So let's write that out. And that gives us basically just 1 minus L1 plus L2 plus L3 plus the sum of the gain products which is basically just uh, the sum of the gain products of the no two non-touching loops, which was L1, L3, which were the two that we're not touching. Okay, does that make sense? This is where we're pulling it, pulling it out. Again, we have figured out L1, L2, L3. We figured out the L1 and L3 were not touching, so that's why they are multiplied together, but we also had to add the gain of all of the loops, which is L1, L2, and L3, and that is how we got this equation for delta right here. So right now it is in terms of L1, L2, L3, so we can write that out with the actual gains. So we get 1 minus L1, so G2, G3, plus, which in this case is actually minus, 
minus L2, which is G1, G2, G5, plus, which again in this case is actually minus, minus G4, G5, plus, and I'm going to run out of space here, plus G2, G3, times G4, G5. And since that G5 is negative, I'm going to stick that minus sign right in front. Oh, I just drew all over creation. Okay, so this is our delta, and we aren't going to simplify it quite yet because our delta k is dependent on this. But, again, just let's take a moment, make sure that you were able to follow where this delta came from. If you need to pause the video, back it up a little bit, and go through it, that's totally fine because you really need to see where this came from. But this right here is delta that is going to be in the denominator. Okay, so really quick, we've figured out delta, we've figured out piece of one and piece of two. All we need to figure out are delta one and delta two. So remember that delta one is where we set all of the gains in delta to zero if they touch the first or second in this case forward path. Okay, Again, that's going to be really confusing. So let's rewrite this portion right here because we are going to use it for our delta 1. It's going to be dependent on that. I'm writing equals. Don't get too hung up on that. Okay, so this is dependent on, and this is where I said that piece of 1 has to match delta 1. So this is where we go back to the original path and say, what was piece of 1? Piece of 1 was from a straight shot from R to node 1 to node 2 to node 3 to node 4 to the output. So we need to say that every gain in this formula right here that does not touch this path remains. Every gain that does, does touch this path goes to zero, which if you look at it, we touch every single node in here. So as we go here, we touch that gain. So all the G1s go to zero. Okay, that was the only one. G2 goes to zero because we touch that node. Um, da, 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 and you can see very quickly where this is going. And actually, since we touched that node, we got G4 in there as well. And we got G3 because G3 touches this node. So as we look at this, all of these go to zero, which you don't need all of them to go to zero, but they all go to zero. So delta 1 actually just equals 1 because you have 1 minus a bunch of zeros because the path touched all of the nodes that those gains touched, G4, G3, G2, G1. This might be a little bit confusing, and it'll be, make a little bit more sense when we do delta 2, which is not going to be quite that bad. So here we have delta 2. Now we're going to look at the forward path of piece of 2. So let's show this really quick, what piece of 2 is. It's going from R to 1, and then skips over to 4, and then out to C. So it doesn't touch nodes 2 and 3, so it doesn't touch gains G2 and G3. So these two gains remain untouched, but since it does touch the nodes that G5 and G4 touch, we get rid of those. So delta 2, we look, okay, G2, G3, those are good. Ah, uh, yes, um, G5 right there is touched, so that goes to zero, which makes this entire portion zero. G4 and G5 go to zero right there, so that entire portion goes to zero. And then G2, G3, and then again we have G4 and G5 that both go to zero. So all of this goes to zero, and all we're left with for delta 2 is 1 minus g2, g3. Okay, did you, did you catch that? The reason that delta 1 went to 1 is because that path had nodes that touched all of the branches that had gain on them that were in this, uh, in this equation. Whereas delta 2, since it basically went around this central part right there, it didn't touch any nodes that, and didn't share any nodes with gain 2 and gain 3, which is why they did not go to 0, and you end up with delta 2 equaling 1 minus g2 times g3. Okay, we have all of the parts now. We figured out the gain of the forward path of path 1, path 2. We figured out delta 1, which is just 1, and delta 2, which is 1 minus g2 times g3. And we have delta, which is that crazy long gain right there. So now we just put it together, and we're going to need a whole new piece of paper just for that. Again, we have P1, which we found to be G1, G2. So uh, let's do the transfer function equals G1, G2 times delta 1, which is just 1, plus P2, the forward gain of path 2, which is G4, 
times delta 2, which we came, we just figured out, where did I put that? Figured out was 1 minus g2 times g3, all over delta, which was 1 minus g2, g3, minus g1, g2, g5, minus g4, g5. My g's are starting to look like sixes. Plus, I'm sorry, this is going on to a new line, minus g2, g3, g4, g5. And that is the answer. Now this can obviously be simplified, but you can see why we didn't want to simplify it immediately because we needed to go figure out the deltas, the delta k's. And that is why we want to wait until this very last step. And um, I'm not going to write down the simplification, but we'll show it on the screen really quick be, and to see what it will actually look like when we're done. Okay, holy cow. So Mason's gain formula, it, there's just so many moving parts. There, it's just a lot of different things and it's really, really, really easy to get lost in it. But everything's very simple. It's just some simple addition and some simple uh, multiplication. It's all about keeping it straight. But don't let this scare you. If that didn't quite make sense to you, I recommend going and reading Kushal's written tutorial and then coming back and watching this again. And I promise by the first video, first reading, second video time, you this will all make sense. And then you just have to do it a couple of times. Kushal actually, actually, I said actually twice. Kushal actually put up some uh, test things that you can go through and make sure that your understanding is correct. And again, it's just a little bit time consuming and it's very easy to get things mixed up, but it's not that complicated as long as you don't get lost in the details. I really, really hope this was helpful because signal flow graphs are super important and Mason's gain, form gain formula are, is just a really powerful tool to make your transfer function as simple as possible without doing all of this manual, oh, can I move this there? Can I move that there? Whatever. Okay. Hope you liked it. If you did like the video, please give it a like. Leave a comment in below because we want, really love your feedback. Subscribe to our channel and all that good stuff, and we will catch you in the next one.